Okay, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Psalm 145 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call upon him. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him. And my mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord. And all flesh shall bless his holy name forever and ever. And Lord, <clears throat> you've truly blessed us. And we recognize that this morning. And Father, I just pray that, um, that you'll continue to give us strength and wisdom as we live in difficult and strange days. But Lord, we're just so confident that you will continue to, to watch over and guide us. And Lord, this morning I want to pray again for our military people and our law enforcement people. And I again pray that you would protect them as they protect us. I pray for our nation and our nation's leaders as you command us to do. And we just pray that you'd be drawing their hearts and minds to yourself again. And Lord, we just uh, ask this morning that you'd help us to grasp the things you'd like to teach us as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are uh, we're still in, in Ephesians. And I want to read just a, a couple of verses from, from first from Ephesians 1 here this morning before we get started. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, And in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So, uh, <clears throat> So we, as we move through this, we're going to see that uh, the key verse, the key verses we're looking at as we move through Ephesians are Ephesians 1, 9, and 10, which says, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. And of course, the, the key or the theme of the book is unity, and the key verse we're going to be, or the key word we're looking at is together. And uh, Ephesians is an interesting book because it's divided right in half. The first, uh, first three chapters tell of, of who we are in Christ. And then the, the last three tell of how the knowledge of who we are in Christ should affect should affect our daily lives. So it's a, it's a very interesting book. And this morning we're going to be moving into some very interesting verses as we, as we move through this book. And so I hope it's not too confusing. Uh, you know, there's the old saying that if there's a mist in the pulpit, there's a fog in the pew. So I don't see if we can keep the fog out this morning. But uh, remember, Ephesians is the, the counterpart of the Old Testament book of Joshua. And Joshua tells of the Israelites claiming their physical inheritance in the land of Canaan. And Ephesians tells of us claiming our spiritual inheritance in Christ. And as we move through Ephesians, we need to pay close attention to the phrases such as in Christ and in him. And we ended last week with Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, which says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So in him we, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. So up till now, Paul has been talking about our inheritance in Christ. But we would have nothing if we did not first, had not first placed our trust in him. 
Now last week we looked at what it means to place our trust in Christ, uh, but I want to look at that again. Uh, the New Testament presents the Lord Jesus as the object of saving faith. So our salvation is in Christ. It is totally of God. And Jesus invited people to, to come to him, to trust him, uh, to, to, to obey him. And just looking at a few verses quickly, in John 3.16 it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in John 14.6, Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So Jesus makes the offer of salvation to all who believe in him. And, though, and these, uh, or there are those who, who place their faith in, in religion or good works. And it doesn't make any difference what religion, whether it's Christianity or whatever. But there are those who place their faith in religion or, or good works. And those who are trusting in works with uh, which they might please God need to focus on John 6, 28 and 29, where it says, then, he, then they said to him, or they said to Jesus, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. So the object of our faith is Jesus Christ. Salvation is the result of placing our faith in the finished work, that of his finished work that he did on the cross of Calvary when he took upon himself the sins of mankind. And at that time, Jesus died a substitutionary death for all men, so that all who believe in him will be saved. He was buried and laid dead in uh, the tomb for three days. And on the third day, he rose from the grave and was seen by over 500 people before he ascended back into heaven. And when we accept this provision of salvation, which uh, was made for us by God himself, we have eternal life. Look again at Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So notice again the highlighted section here. Having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now we touched on this last week also, but we need to understand clearly the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Holy Spirit is not a power, but a person. He's the third member of the Godhead. In John 16, 13, it says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Now the reason we know that the Holy Spirit is a person is because of the way he is referred to. When he will come, he will guide you in all truth. Now once we have placed our faith in Christ, we become the children of God. And at that instant, we are sealed, and the Holy Spirit comes and indwells us. The Holy Spirit is like an engagement ring. Now today, Janet and I are celebrating our, our 50th wedding anniversary, so 50 years ago, we exchanged rings. And just like that ring proclaimed that our lives became one, the Holy Spirit is the seal or guarantee that we as believers are part of God's family. The rings are a sign of, of our commitment to one another. And marriage is, a, is an important thing. And over the years, Janet and I have had the privilege of counseling several young Christian couples before they married. And um, I want to tell you about just one of them this morning. 
this uh, couple dated for several years and kept themselves sexually pure in the process. And this is something that is actually poo-hooed by many today, even many believers. A lot of people think that early sexual activity is natural and normal. The interesting thing is, is this, this young couple, both of them came from very dysfunctional homes. And early on, they decided that they wanted a deeper and more meaningful relationship than either of either set of their parents had. And this is what they were telling us as we were counseling them. And that's why they chose godly standards for themselves. It's been a few years back. This couple actually has five kids now, but <clears throat> we, won't, we won't get into that. It's just... Uh... But the time came when this young man gave the young woman who had agreed to be his bride... A diamond ring and that diamond engagement ring was to seal the deal the ring was a promise or a guarantee that a wedding would take place at a certain date and I got to perform that wedding it was a real joy to see these two come together and as we talked with them one of them mentioned that among their peers when they were doing the, the the premarital counseling that said their, their peers saw marriage as unnecessary. The feeling was that you can have everything in the marriage without the commitment. Is that true? Well, outside of marriage, people have sex, they have children, they own homes, and they share expenses. What difference then, then does the ceremony make? Well, the ceremony states emphatically that there is a commitment to one another. And without commitment, there's no real love. Now, people might argue that with me, but that's my humble but accurate opinion. <laughs> Many people live together today without marriage vows. And if you ask why, they'll tell you what I just mentioned that they have everything that marriage has to offer without the vows. But I think, in most cases, the real reason is they don't want to, they, the real reason they don't want to seal the deal is they want a walkout clause. If they find that uh, they want to get out of the relationship, they want to be able to do so without any complications. And at the core of their relationship is the knowledge that someday we may want out. And so they live with that provision. In reality, their relationship is based on conditional acceptance. If something happens to their partner that renders them no longer physically attractive, or diminishes their net value, or creates any kind of burden... They're free to leave. And again, there's no true love without commitment. Now, God loved us enough that we are given the Holy Spirit as a promise that he will always be there for us. The Holy Spirit is a statement whereby God is saying, I never want out of this relationship. But he goes one step further. He says, and I'm never going to let you out either. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And one day there will be a marriage supper of the Lamb when we are taken as the bride of Christ and will be forever with the Lord. The Holy Spirit is our engagement ring. He's the seal and promise that this will happen. But unlike a, a regular engagement ring that just encircles the finger as a silent reminder of, of a promise, the Holy Spirit is more than just a silent reminder. The Holy Spirit teaches us about our betrothed. He teaches us about the one we are promised to. And we need to be taught. When we come to, to Christ, we have very little knowledge about who God is and what he's really like. In 1 Corinthians 
2.14, it says, But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. Before we come to Christ, we're spiritually separated from God, and therefore we're incapable of discerning who he is or anything about him. As a matter of fact, the average unsaved person sees this whole spiritual life thing that, that I'm talking about as foolishness. So when uh, we, we come to know Christ, we begin an education process, and that process is handled by the Holy Spirit of God. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 11, it says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of God except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now, because we are physical beings and our eyes and ears cannot comprehend the wonderful things which our gracious Heavenly Father has prepared for us. Now, we saw last week that God has chosen to communicate with us. He's not obligated to let us in on what His will is, but He chooses to do so. And this is, is a mark of the relationship that he desires to have with each one of us. Because I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. And this is consistent with what Jesus said to his disciples in John 15:15. 15, 15. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. But I've called you friends, for all things that I heard from my Father I have made known to you. So the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead, and he takes up residence within each of us as believers to help us understand the things of God. He is the guarantee of our inheritance. In Ephesians 1, 15 and 16, it says, Therefore, I also, having heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So here we see that Paul had heard of these Ephesian believers, and he's thrilled about their faith. And, and what's being talked about. And because he says, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. That's one of the things that's evident in, uh, in the family of God. The testimony of these, these new believers was causing an impact on others. And because of this, Paul is continually making mention of them in his prayers. What do you think uh, Paul is talking about when he says he makes mention of them? Well, I think Paul had uh, committed himself to praying for them, regardless of whether he, he had any current information about their needs or not. Uh, when I pray, I, I make mention of a lot of people. I may come across names in my, on my prayer list that, uh, that I know very little about, uh, and so I just mention them. I tell the, the Lord, well, I, I don't know how this person is doing, but I know that you do, and so I'm just going to mention them to you. And then I pray for them in the areas that I know that all people need prayer in. And this is what Paul does. Even though he doesn't know the, specific, the specifics, notice how he prays for them. He prays for these Ephesians here in Ephesians 1.17. He prays that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And notice that Paul is, was, was praying about in regard to them. First, we see him, uh, him praying that God may give 
you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul wants these believers to be wise, but not wise in the ways of the world. He wants them to be wise in the revelation and knowledge of God. And we find a lot of, of knowledgeable people in the world today, but we don't find a lot of wise people. We find even fewer people who are wise in the Spirit as pertaining to the Word of God, but there's, uh, there's no excuse for the Christian to remain ignorant in regard to the Scripture, especially since we have the Word of God in our language. There's a lot of places, a lot of people groups that don't. In John 16, 13, it says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Having the Word of God in our language and having the indwelling Holy Spirit, we have available to us all we need to understand the Bible. The problem is, most, uh, most believers don't spend enough time in the Word to really allow the Spirit of God to, to teach them. And Ephesians 1, 17 through 18 says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now that's quite a, quite a lot to think about here, so we'll be breaking it down a little bit. But this is Paul's prayer for the Ephesian believers, and we're going to, uh, to find that he prays for them again later. But notice... Notice how he prays. He doesn't pray that the eyes of their understanding might be enlightened. He prays a statement, not a request. He says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Because he's talking to believers here. We could uh, rephrase this this way. Because the eyes of your understanding are enlightened. Now as a believer... You're given insight. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit begins to teach you about himself and about the Father and the Son. And so you're given insight. And we also need to see something in regard to this word. This, uh, it's the eyes of your understanding. This word understanding is what I'm talking about. Um, the Greek, in the word, uh, this word in the Greek is uh, dianoia. And it's referring to your heart. And it could actually be properly translated that way. The eyes of your heart being enlightened. This is referring to your core being or the seat of your emotions. And as I thought about this, I thought it might be fun to check uh, out this in my Indonesian Bible. Indonesians believe that it's your liver that's the heart not, not your heart that is the seat of your understanding or the core of your being. And sure enough, when I checked it out, it read, Sapaya ia manjarikan matahatimu. Or in other words, he has opened the eyes of your liver. <laughs> now in Indonesian, instead of telling Janet that I love her with all my heart, I could say, Saya cinta kaparamu dengan semua hatimu. Or, I love you with all my liver. <laughs> now, I think that's quite romantic, don't, don't you? <laughs> I, I think there's really, we could really go with that somewhere. Serious though, as I, I thought about this word, at first I saw it as just a, kind of an interesting triviality. But he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. It's very clear that in our English translations that what's being op opened up here or enlightened here is the eyes of a person's core being. This might seem silly, but notice that it doesn't say the eyes of your, your intellect being enlightened. And nor does it say the eyes of your mind, but the eyes of your understanding or your heart, your inner being or, or core, the real, the real you. And as I thought about this, I realized that a person might be brilliant intellectually, but that's no guarantee that they have an understanding of spiritual truth. 
Paul is talking about an opening of the heart and soul of a person. And this is significant because Christianity is not merely dry intellectualism. It is a relationship with our Creator. It truly is a relationship. And your walk with God doesn't depend on how smart you are. Spiritual understanding that comes to the heart only comes to those who have accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Doesn't make any difference how often you darken the church door or how much money you give or how many times you, may, you mow the neighbor's lawn. It's a, a relationship with your Creator. Now, I've run into people who have memorized large portions of biblical text. They've studied the, the culture and the historical setting of the majority of Scripture. And some have gone to theological schools and, and earned degrees. And sometimes they've, we've seen such men as they have been interviewed on TV and when the world seeks out an educated man to consult about the Bible. And if you're like me, you've been amazed at the spiritual ignorance of some of these so-called experts. The op opening of the eyes of our understanding comes as a result of responding to the message of salvation. If not, they see it all as foolishness. It's not enough to just be familiar with the story, but believing that what Jesus Christ did on a cross, he did for you personally. The instant I made this personal, the instant I believed, I was adopted into the family of God and given an inheritance. Also at that time, a process began to conform me into the image of Christ. And not me only, but this happens to every person who places their faith in Christ. The eyes of my understanding were enlightened as the Holy Spirit started guiding me into truth. And our eyes are enlightened for a purpose. But let's, let's get back and look at this again in, in Ephesians 1.18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Okay, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. Well, what is the hope of his calling? His calling is, is, is the inheritance that we have in Christ that we have been talking about. The fact that we are in him. That we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. That we have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us and that the Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. That we, may have, that, that we have Christ in us, the hope of glory. That we have been redeemed. That we've been forgiven. This is the hope of his calling. Look at this again. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint. Now look, look at what else we are to understand. That you may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now notice that this is not talking about our inheritance at this time. This is talking about his inheritance, Jesus Christ's inheritance. And notice that his inheritance is in the saints. Now think about that. This isn't saying that Jesus sees us as in his inheritance. This is saying that Jesus, well, that's what it's saying. It's that Jesus sees us as his inheritance. Did you know that Jesus is looking forward to spending eternity with you and I? And, and notice that he says, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now this was really took some thinking as we, I moved through this. He's saying that we are his riches. That we are the things that make Christ rich. 
Now this kind of goes against our grain, doesn't it? Aren't we still in our sinful bodies? Aren't we unworthy of all that he's provided for us? Yes. But the, val the value of something is, is what you're willing to pay for it. And Jesus Christ endured the cross, shedding his blood for you and I. He sees you and I as a trophy of his grace. He sees you and I as his riches. Never belittle yourself as a Christian. You're a child of the king and a rich possession of the king himself. In Ephesians 1, 18 through 20, it says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power in which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the heavenly places. And look at the highlighted phrase here. What is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Now there's a lot of misunderstanding in the many Christian circles about spiritual power. But let me say that uh, the individual believer has no power at all in and of himself. Christians are not storage batteries where, uh, that are periodically empowered or recharged by God. We already have a direct link to the power of God through the indwelling Holy Spirit. And this is the same power that raised Christ from the dead. So to pray to God for power when uh, we already have the Spirit dwelling within us is absurd. And yet I know many believers who act as if the power of God comes and goes in their lives. It doesn't work that way. We don't have to pray for the power of God. All we have to do is stay connected to the source. In John 15, 4 and 5, it says, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. And neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. Notice that it says, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me, you can do nothing. Jesus is the source. I don't, I don't want to do anything without him because what I accomplish without him is worthless. I have nothing. As, as your pastor, I have nothing within myself to give you. It's only what I have through Christ. And as a believer, I shouldn't be concerned about spiritual power. I should be instead focused on abiding in Christ. Well, it's interesting. If you read on through John 15, and this isn't in my notes, <laughs> but if you read John, on through John 15, it tells about, do that sometime. Check out the whole chapter. And what does it mean to abide? You know what it means? To abide in Christ is to walk as one who is loved. It's phenomenal. When you really understand who God is in your life, when you start walking as one who is loved, it makes an amazing difference in your life. And you are he sees you, you're the riches of his grace. As believers, we need to learn to walk as one who is loved. That's being connected with the vine. And then you bear much fruit. Does that mean a whole bunch of people are going to come to Christ because of that? No. It means the fruit of the Spirit or evidence in your life, the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, the goodness, the faith. That's what it means. When you abide in Christ, that is evident in your life and that draws people to you. And guess what? Then you're not living your life so worried about the next election. You live your life connected with the vine 
and you actually enjoy living. Sorry. Get a little carried away here. I've got to stay within the realm here. You, you just have to listen faster. Okay, we'll get it, move on here. So let's look again at Ephesians 1, 18 and 19. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. The power here is the same power that raised Christ from the dead and which God will use in our behalf when he deems it necessary. One of these days, he's going to raise us. And the context is still Paul's prayer to the Ephesians. It was his desire that they come to understand all they had in Christ. But let's conclude this morning by reading, uh, reading Ephesians 1, 19 through 23. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. After Christ died on the cross, he presented his blood as a payment for all of us, for all mankind, he presented his blood as a payment for our sin. And then he took a seat at the right hand of God. And when you put your faith and your trust in that provision, he gives you eternal life and the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. That's what it is. It's not attending this church or that church or anything else. It is your direct relationship with the Creator God. And notice here it doesn't say far it doesn't say above all principality, power and might and dominion. It says far above all principality, power, might and dominion. And we are his inheritance. What a thrill. To walk in the knowledge of that truth and to, to, re, to realize that nothing in heaven or on earth can change that. As believers, we have the Holy Spirit of God as a seal and a promise that one day we'll be with Him. And thank you for listening. <laughs>